Hi there, Nate Urandi, Orion Training Systems. Fresh off of an indoor trainer workout uh, a couple days ago, it was 80 degrees here in Boulder, Colorado. Next day it was in the 20s and snowing and sleeting. That's just the way it is. So, a couple things. This is going to be about power, about FTP, testing, about training zones. So bear with me through a few parts. I've got some visuals. Unfortunately, no whiteboard, but I'm going old school. So I've been using power myself since about 2009, and I've had some issues with the standard methodology of doing things. And a little bit, a little while ago, I was doing an indoor workout and staring down at my power meter, and I'm seeing the average power versus the normalized power for both the workout as well as uh, the individual interval I was doing. And all of a sudden, it, it just dawned on me that there is a better way to not only test power, but to also establish training zones. So I'm going to take you through uh, a few visuals here and explain how I got to my idea that I think is uh, definitely hitting a nail on the head. So again, old school. Here are the typical FTP tests, and I'm using this so that you can pause the video and take a snapshot or, or write it down, whatever you want. But this is pretty standard stuff. Option one, um, five minutes all out, 10 minutes easy, then goes the 20 minute test, get your average power, get your average heart rate, and then multiply your average watts by 0 0.95, so 95% in order to reach your FTP and then you base your training zones off that. Another option, which is, I would say, just as popular, is just a th straight 30-minute test. So you do not do the initial five-minute all-out session. And say you do 30 minutes, take your average watts, your average heart rate, and then whatever your average watts end up being, that equals your FTP. So there is no handicapping as there is with option one. So here's the problem with this. Um, especially with option one. When you do that five minute all out effort, you're spiking your heart rate, you're spiking your blood lactate. FTP, functional threshold power, lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold, whatever you want to call it, typically falls right around four millimoles of blood lactate. When you do something like a five minute all out effort, you're spiking your millimoles of blood lactate to 8, 10, 12, something way higher than 4. And so here's our next visual. And this is what your heart rate, this is just an example of what your heart rate and your blood lactate might do during a ramp test, or during any test for that matter. And so on the y-axis, you see lactate going up and up and up, and on the x-axis, you see heart rate getting higher as it comes out. And these bullet points are examples of where your blood lactate might be based on where your heart rate is. Whoop. And so this dotted line is lactate threshold, FTP, anaerobic, th anaerobic threshold, whatever you want to call it. So that is typically what you can hold for, say, a 40K time trial on the bike, Roughly a 10K, maybe as much as a 15K, but probably a 10K on the run and call it, a, you know, a, a 1.5K swim. So if this is what you're striving to measure as far as your power output and you can't do it in a lab because all the assumption here is that you're self-testing, which is perfectly fine, then what good is it? to spike your lactate way up here for a five minute test, only recover 10 minutes, and then try to perform really well at this level. It makes no sense, quite frankly, physiologically. So then I started reading up a little bit. And what I find is that there's a lot of talk about average power, normalized power. You know, normalized power is typically uh, billed as a more accurate representation of the load of the workout you're doing if you held a very consistent power output from start to finish. 
So think of it in terms of riding down a dead straight road um, with no undulation and you're pedaling the whole time. That's effectively what a normalized power number looks like when it's at odds with an average power number. So um, if you're doing a climbing workout and you're going up and descending, up and descending, typically there's a fairly large variance between average power and normalized power because when you're descending, especially at speed, you're not going to be pedaling at all, which totally nosedives your average power. So the normalized power number says, if you did this entire workout at a steady state, this is what your output would be. That makes a lot of sense. And so what hit me between the eyes during this workout that I mentioned earlier was, why isn't normalized power and average power taken into account during any sort of testing protocol? And another reason is because whether you're a cyclist or whether you're a triathlete, there is no steady state effort that you do that pegs a specific range of watts. What I mean by that is there is never a stick straight road that's dead flat with no wind. There's always wind. There's always twisting, turning, rising, falling, and therefore your power always rises and falls accordingly. So why don't we take normalized power and average power and factor those things into any sort of test protocol because it more accurately represents what the output in a race is going to be. See how there's that correlation there? The test protocol should mirror what the race protocol is going to be. So here are my suggestions for alternative FTP testing. Option one is a 20 minute test. Option two is a 30 minute test. I think those are pretty valid durations. But the point is that with the 20 minute test, you do it as equal parts of on off. And the intervals for the on off range from 30 seconds to one minute. So you might do 20 minutes of 30 seconds on 30 seconds off or 40 seconds on 40 seconds off, 50 seconds on 50 seconds off or one minute on one minute off. That's the range, but you have to use the same range for the entire test. So if you start off 45 seconds on 45 seconds off, you keep it there for the entire 20 minutes. And then what you do is you track your average power, which will peak at the end of the last on period. And then during the last off period, you watch your normalized power and see where it peaks. Then you average those two numbers. So if your uh, average power is 260 and your normalized power is 300, the average of those two is 280. You then multiply that by 0.93 to reach your FTP. Why 0 0.93? Because for a 20 minute test, there's quite a bit of anaerobic capacity going on that I think inflates the numbers. And 0 0.95 just isn't the right number to multiply it by in my mind based on my own experiences over the past nearly decade. Option two is the 30 minute test. Same exact protocol, equal parts on off for the entire 30 minutes, except at the end, your FTP is that raw average of your average and normalized power. So you do not handicap it as you would in the 20 minute test. Now this makes a lot of sense to me. Again, because averaged and normalized power, both are very valuable numbers. We need to take both of those into account for training, for racing, and therefore for the testing we do. Now, to me, I've always had a problem with training zones. This even predates power when you would just go off, say, heart rate. And so what I'm about to show you can also be done for your heart rate training zones, whether you uh, establish those off max heart rate or whether you establish those off of lactate threshold heart rate. And so what I never understood is why... When one zone ends, the other starts 1% higher than that. To me, that's just convenience. And quite frankly, uh, being adept at math, I take it a little uh, <laughs> as an intellectual slight. Like, am I not smart enough to know that uh, 
I can uh, calculate different zones off different numbers. I digress. So here's how I adjust the training zones for my athletes. So the current ones shouldn't be any um, surprise. You know, below 55% is your zone one. L2 is 56, and that's a 75. Uh, sorry for the misprint. 56 to 75%. Then it's 76 to 90, and so on and so on. Here's the revised, though. There's overlap. So zone one is up to 58%. Then zone two starts down at 55% and goes up to 78%. Zone three starts down at 75%, and so on. This makes a lot more sense as well. And the reason is, is because they're training zones. There is no, there is nothing in the body that says after this point, this energy system or this stress level shuts down and this one starts. And so if the training zone is uh, exactly that, a zone, then there's going to be natural overlap between one zone and the next. It's not a huge overlap, but 2 to 3% makes perfect sense, and it's much more natural, and it's much more in line with the physiological changes that occur in the body as you go from training extremely easy to moderate to extremely hard. So that's it. Hopefully that was a useful use of your uh, 10 minutes or so. As always, leave comments below, and uh, certainly keep the dialogue coming. I think this is uh, one step in the right direction or a couple steps in the right direction. Give it a try, and uh, hopefully you think so as well. Happy training.